Okay, so thank you very much, Alfredo. And so up front, like the others, I want to thank the, the organizers, Tamara and, and Alexander, wherever he is. And I think also on Monday, you, you, huh? He said this, you will only hear it in the back. So he said it's on, so, okay. Uh, and you, I think you, on Monday, you also mentioned some other organizers, right? Like you, Mattia, and uh, Ken, Ken, Ken. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me and also my family. That's greatly appreciated. Um, so I will speak about our work with Jin Ho, who's also present. Um, this is going to appear uh, in the Annals of Applied Probabilities later this year. It was online since August last year, so it's frankly fresh. And it's about, well, the meeting between Ginebra and and, and Schrodinger. So in a nutshell, it's a topic on extreme value statistics in, in random matrix theory. Now that's a very classical subject because suppose you look at invariant ensembles, then we know extreme values like the largest eigenvalue thanks to, to Greg's work many years ago, we know we will discover some Poinlevé functions. And if you know work by Shoshnikov of 1999 about universality of the local scaling limits of those correlation functions, then you know you're not just gonna discover Tracy with them in GO, GU, and GSE, but in a bigger class, right? So you got the Poinlevé functions on one side, but now if you go from Hermitian matrices to non-Hermitian matrices, you discover a completely different world, right? There's Ginebra ensembles that Gernot was the first one here in the conference on Monday talked about. So there the theory is in some sense much more boring because the extreme value statistics is governed by much more elementary functions, elementary distributions. Right? So it's, it's Gumbel distribution generically. But there is one, one peculiar exception from the rule where you're neither gonna discover Gumbel, elementary stuff, nor Poinlevé. And that's when we discover Schrodinger. That will be the topic of this talk. So it's about extreme value statistics in the real Ginebra ensemble, more precisely the fluctuations of the largest real eigenvalue. Okay? Okay, that's why the name of the talk, because, well, they met at least as a result of our work with Jinho. But before I start with math, so what we could ask ourselves, is there actually a chance that these two quite distinguished scientists met ever in real life? So what you do, well, I went to Google and I looked them up. Of course, with Schrodinger, that is super easy. Uh, he's known to the general public because of the kitty cats. Um, He's, he was the, the senior among the three fathers of quantum mechanics. He passed away in 61. On the other hand, with Ginebra, of course, the circular law um, that he did in the 60s. And then after that, he ventured into statistical mechanics. So you might know that there's correlation inequalities, Fautin, Castellin, and Ginebra. Um, he's still alive. He has worked recently in PDE theory. So this picture here, circular law, when Ginebra was working in random matrix theory is from 1965. This was the first time when he wrote it down, which was four years after uh, Schrodinger passed away, okay? So chances are not good that the two uh, met for real, but it's still possible, right, based on that data. So, well, I wrote to Ginebra and asked him the same question. <laughs> if, if, he, if he actually met Schrodinger, but he said, well, unfortunately not. So. It's, it's, I apologize, it's fake title. They did not, they did not meet in person, okay? Okay, so but that aside, now let's start with the science. Um, so what I did while preparing this lecture and while we were also working with Jinho, there are some peculiar similarities between actually Gaussian orthogonal ensemble and Ginebra orthogonal ensemble, and that's how the talk is structured. So I will first talk about, well, review, of course, at least to this audience, about Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, and then we move to Ginebra, right? So the setup, multiple times mentioned here in the, in the conference, uh, symmetric matrices, bold X, real entries, the building blocks of Y, I, I, D, normal random variables. Um, Wigner introduced this, but the formulation I choose here actually goes back to meta, because Wigner was talking about Hamiltonians, right? 
and the invariance property of the Haar measure. Um, and only if you know a theorem by Hermann Weyl, then you can translate Wigner's approach to what's written here. And this was achieved by Meta in 1960. Within that, of course, you got two objectives that you could look at. You could look at the eigenvectors or eigenvalues, but eigenvectors, right, these are symmetric matrices. You have a spectral theorem that will tell you that they are uniformly distributed over some hemisphere of a big sphere. So that's not so interesting. Much more interesting are the eigenvalues. They are ordered here. Generically, they are distinct, so I order them like this. So the Unlike other talks, the, the, the first is for me the smallest and not the largest, okay? They form logars and like Francesco was saying in his talk, this is a standard textbook calculation. Um, the joint probability density function is written out here. This was actually known before Wigner. Uh, this appeared right before the war in a, in a paper by a Chinese mathematician. It took a while to, to venture to the Western world, but this was the first time that you can find a formula like this. Okay, good. Questions, of course, local and global scaling behavior, the limit laws. There's remarkable integrable structure present. Um, I think this is the first time in this conference that we see the Pfaffians. Everything previously that was integrable was always determinantal. So here the eigenvalue is from the Pfaffian process. So the rescaled marginal density is a Pfaffian of, well, uh, constructed in terms of this matrix valued kernel. Again, using Francesco's words, this is a standard textbook calculation and that is known to many people. I, I, I don't need the formulas for these, for these matrix kernels. You can write them out in terms of skew orthogonal polynomials. So what? Um, I'm interested in the scaling limits. So first, the global, the empirical spectral distribution, it converges almost surely once rescaled correctly to the Wigner semicircle distribution. This is the standard result, the mother of all results that this picture we get tired of seeing. Um, um, but although it is the mother of all results in random matrix, it was not Wigner who first proved it in the way it is written here. Wigner was working on a sort of a subclass of matrices. He didn't prove almost sure convergence, if you read the paper carefully. Um, uh, this was done, this is a universality theorem in the 60s. Ludwig Arnold was the first one who attacked it. So now we know this is not just true for GOE, this is true in a much bigger class of Wigner matrices that we all know of. Okay, good. Now having this theorem, the next step is of course the local scaling behavior. Local scaling behavior here, actually for the rest of the talk, I'm never gonna be concerned about the bulk because I said this is work on extreme value statistics. So here we zoom in on, well, the right edge point. The scaling limit of that matrix, two by two matrix kernel, is 20 years old. Uh, Peter Forrester and friends in 1999 outcomes a limiting kernel, uh, bold Q, so this is a two by two matrix. Uh, the subscript AI well indicates that this highly involves area functions. Um, here are the entries, it's not so bad. Uh, I show you those entries now because later I will try to answer the same question in real Geneva ensemble. So the structure is gonna be quite useful. So you have, well, four entries, right? One, one, two, two, one, two, two, one. Some of them are trace, some of those kernels give rise to trace class integral operators, but unfortunately not the two, one, because there's always this peculiar signum function floating around. Okay, here out front, that guy here, that would govern the scaling limit in the GUE, that is the classical area kernel, which is written here as this product and then integral of two area functions. Good, also here I would like to make a comment about universality of the result. This is what I mentioned earlier with Shoshnikov, 1999, he showed that for real Wigner matrices with some technical constraints in place, you will also land on those scaling limits, good. Having, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in your way. Um, landing now on those scaling limits, uh, you can formulate now finally the, the real thing, the fluctuations of the largest of so the real extreme value statistics central limit theorem. This one, uh, you creep up to the right edge, square root 2n, and you fluctuate around it in a, well, in the scale as written here, and the Fluctuations are Craig's fluctuations, Tracy Widom. Um, however, here, this formula you might not know by heart right away. 
Um, this is the formula in terms of the matrix uh, kernel. This is, uh, notice the year here, 2005. This was later than the, the, the first formula. Um, but I prefer this one right now because I just talked about the matrix valued kernel, so it makes sense to express the limiting distribution functions in terms of that thing. Okay, got to be careful here, this needs to be properly regularized. Also, you need these conjugation factors so that the whole product here is actually Hilbert Schmidt and this determinant makes sense well on, on this space. Okay, mm -hmm. but it's a technicality. Now, the formulas that you might know better are actually simpler, but before I show them to you, of course, the standard pictures, you get densities versus distribution functions. Red is the Gaussian. Blue is F1, okay? Uh, moments uh, here, still quite peculiar. Tracy Witham is such a universal thing, but we have no clue if these things are actually transcendental numbers or not. There are some formulas, of course, for the moments in terms of Poinlevy and, and, and other things, but this is not really, you know, <laughs> this here is, is, of course, super easy <laughs> because we know the moment generating function, but here this is, it doesn't truncate after the three, okay? That's all I'm saying. Good. Now here are the other formulas, um, easier ones, at least if you're interested in generating quickly within a few minutes those plots and pulling out those moments, uh, these formulas here are better. The first one is airy determinant, so we go from the regularized determinant and matrix kernels, we go to Fredholm determinant and scalar kernels, right? So here's these, this classical scalar airy kernel, but then in GOE you have always this, well, uh, rank one perturbation that you add to it, kernel is written out here. This is 2006, Peter Forrester, and now the famous one, that, the real first one, the famous uh, Tracy Widham GOE from 1996, that's the one you probably all know by heart in terms of Poinlevy, right? So there's this Q who satisfies a, a distinguished second order uh, ODE and you pick a very specific solution. That's all I want to say about this. Okay, uh, in some sense the most compact formula for the, for the distribution function here is actually this one, my favorite, so Ferrari Spohn 2005, a single Fretholm determinant, one minus F. So F, the airy kernel earlier here, this was integral airy function times airy function. So this allows you to, in some sense, factorize the airy operator into two integral operators where the kernel is just the airy function. And that's what I'm trying to indicate here. Good, so that's it. So let's keep, our, let's keep those formulas in mind and now we will go to real Genebra and see, well, what was known and what not and then we will stumble upon what we did with Jinho, okay? So, <coughs> excuse me. So real Genebra, uh, well, somewhat GOE but non-symmetric, okay? So you just square matrices, IID, <coughs> normal random variables. Born in 1965 in a paper by Genebra, unlike Wigner, he didn't have a physical motivation back in the day. The, the physical applicability of Genebra ensemble started in the early 70s. There's a famous paper by Robert May in Nature about this. Nevertheless, so now methodologically we're going to do the same thing. What about eigenvalue statistics? So introduce coordinates. You don't, you no longer have symmetry, so in general you have to face complex eigenvalues. Uh, the first L coordinates are reserved for the real, purely real eigenvalues. Then the next M for the ones in the upper half plane, Xi plus I, Yi. And that's it, because you're looking at real matrices, right? So the ones in the lower half plane are just the, 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 the start complex conjugate of those. So you only need to build in this constraint here, that L plus 2M is equal to N. Good. Now, the probability density function, that was a big challenge. It took, uh, I think, almost 30 years. Ginebra did not manage himself. Um, the partial uh, probability joint, the partial joint probability density function, so for each pair L and M, you have to compute one. This was achieved in the early 90s by Lehmann and Sommers. And it's this formula here. So this is very different than uh, 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 complex Ginebra or symplectic Ginebra. This is not just here an exponent of one, two, and four. There's a fundamental difference here now. Uh, I mean the following sense. So the first line, of course, this looks very much like GOE, right? Uh, but the second line, absolutely not. So that's the big difference. You got these error, complementary error functions in here with the 
absolute value of the imaginary part of Zj. As for the notation, so up here I had my alphas and betas. Now here I work in terms of Z. So this means I, I, I summarize them in an n-dimensional complex vector. The first L are the alphas, the next M the betas, and then the ones in the lower half plane. Okay, this is very different here from GOE. Uh, in particular, because it tells you right away from the bat that whatever probability law this density induces, it's not going to be absolutely continuous. Right? So that means there ought to be Lebesgue null sets in the complex plane that will be assigned non-vanishing likelihood under this um, law here. And this is an extremely famous result. Uh, it was first quantified by Alan Edelman in 1997. So here's your Lebesgue null set, the real line in the complex plane. The likelihood that all the eigenvalues in the real Ginebra ensemble are real is not zero. It's 2 to the minus n fourth n minus 1. Uh, I like to point out this was uh, generalized uh, eight years later by Gernot. Uh, computed the likelihood that say that k out of n eigenvalues in the real Ginebra ensemble are real. It's also of course not going to be zero. Okay, this is famous. It's not absolutely continuous and it's certainly a big, big difference to, to uh, Gaussian invariant ensembles. Good. Now, what about limit law? So we sh should see also there, of course, now differences. Well, the first thing is, well, the introduction of correlation functions. It, it looks messy, but, well, it, methodologically, it's not so far-fetched, right? You, you take the partial density here, you integrate out a batch of your variables. The alphas, those are the real ones over the real axis, and the betas over the plane. You give it a certain weighting, and then out comes again the Pfaffian structure, which was detected 10 years ago by Alexei and, and Chris Sinclair in a CMP paper. So there's four kernels now. All of them are two by two. Four because, well, you can study correlations between the real eigenvalues itself, between the complex itself, and then those mixtures. Okay, and that's why you have four limiting kernels. Again, formulas you can all find in their paper. Uh, uh, which I, I, I spare you. Um, uh, <clears throat> good. Now about scaling limits. So the first one, this is well the circular law, the empirical spectral distribution, same normalization as n goes to infinity. Almost surely you will land on the uh, unit disk as the droplet. Um, and that's the picture that I showed you at the beginning. Now here, so careful, some always people mistake here this blue stuff as the coordinate axis. So this is not the coordinate axis. So the blue dots are eigenvalues, okay? So you can clearly see here what's known as the Saturn effect, right? So here you should see this, not the coordinate axis, right? And here as well, okay? And this is, uh, well, a relic from this non, not being absolutely continuous. You got a very peculiar effect going on here. What you also maybe might detect is if you zoom in close to the real axis, so a small window around it, then there seems to be much more white than blue, right? Um, here you can probably clearly see it. Uh, so this means that apparently um, purely complex eigenvalues close to the real axis, they prefer to sit on the axis than, than being away from it. Okay? Also this is uh, rigorously proven. Here's a density plot, so you just look into Alan Edelman's paper, find the formula. So this is the density of the real eigenvalues. It will well pointwise converge to the uniform density on minus one to one. And here you get for one size, 100 by 100, uh, the density of the complex eigenvalues. So this is a real part, imaginary part, and then here's a graph, the, the density. So here on top you see the plateau forming, that will be the, the, the unit disk, but you see the sharp dip to zero, right? So if you cut through like this, uh, level y equals zero, the density of the complex eigenvalues goes down to zero. And that's what I just said, there's more white than blue close to the axis. Good. Nice. Now, universality. That was uh, a big challenge. It's less than 10 years old, so the circular law has a very rich history. It started in the 80s by Gerko, um, Silverstein, Zingdong Bai uh, contributed, and now this appears to be the finished result, so Tao Wu 2010. Um, Non-Hermitian real or complex matrices with IID entries, as long as you got finite second moment, you will always discover the circular limit law. 
Good. Now, local eigenvalue regime. So now you've got to be a bit careful. So we know from Alexei and Chris' paper that there's four correlation kernels. And in this talk, I said I'm only concerned about edge statistics. So in principle, I should show you four scaling limits, right? But I don't, because for our purposes, this one will do. So this is the scaling limit of the real, real correlation kernel. So I zoom in on, well, the, the, the largest uh, real right point, square root n, and I wiggle around, and as n goes to infinity, this one comes out. This was computed in the same paper, 29. Uh, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, there was a mistake, a serious mistake, I, in particular in this line. So the form that was obtained, which I will show you in a second, it was wrong, and this was fixed, well, not so long ago. Um, Oleg Zaboronsky and Roger Tribe, those names have appeared, and uh, Michael Poflaski, who was a postdoc at that time in Warwick. And this was important for our work with Gino, that this formula was fixed. So here's the formula. And now the uh, peculiar thing is, so if you, if you took a nap for the past 10 minutes, and so you shut your eyes right before I showed you the, the airy kernels and now those kernels, you wouldn't notice the difference at all. The only thing that has changed is instead of the letters A and I, I have this, this is Mathrak E in tech. It has precisely the same structure as earlier, okay? The difference is really what is this Mathrak E, okay? Well, instead of airy function, it's actually much nicer. It's just a, well, Gaussian hump e to the minus x squared. Okay, that's the only difference in some sense between right now, at least, uh, between GOE scaling limit and real Genebre scaling limit for the um, uh, for the for the real real correlation kernel. Okay, well, right now it seems harmless, but this this will get back at us for for a reason. Okay, good. Um, universality, whether this kernel is universal is not known to this date. Uh, the universality theorems about local um, eigenvalue statistics in non-Hermitian matrix model at the edge are still uh, uh, ongoing research topics. Okay, good, but then let's well just focus on real Genebra, orthogonal, real Genebra ensemble and as I said in the very first minute of the talk, so I will be interested in the largest real eigenvalue of a real Genebra matrix. Here's the central limit theorem, uh, as n goes to infinity square root n and you wiggle around randomly, notice there's no rescaling here by n to some power. Uh, and that random variable, its cumulative distribution function was computed five years ago. Uh, Brian Ryder, he was here, I think, a couple of weeks ago. He gave lectures. And again, Chris Sinclair. Well, unfortunately, uh, 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 Brian and Chris, they relied on the, on the paper 29 by Alexei and himself where the mistake happened and they didn't notice. So the formula in here was unfortunately also wrong. Um, which then was corrected uh, two years ago by the same three people from Warwick. Okay, here's a, here's a result. Again, I start talking about the, 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 the regularized determinant. So here's this matrix kernel sandwiched in between those uh, convergence factors. Okay, that's the result. If you're interested in plots, so here are some density and again distribution plots. So blue is Tracy Widom, GOE, and red, well, is whatever you saw on the last slide. So it is uh, skewed to the right instead of left, as it is for Tracy Widom, the case. Um, so if you in particular numerically compute the moments, so the skewness is a, is a centralized third moment, right? You should, you should see a sign difference here, and that, that's what you see. These are all numerical computations. These are not exact. Okay. Good. Um, formulas, formulas, formulas. So we had the regularized two determinant. What was actually found or written down in, in Ryder Sinclair and then also later is this formula, but I translated it back to the matrix formula of the previous slide. So it was this formula. Again, extremely similar to GOE. Instead of the subscripts AI, you got those exponential functions floating around. What was not known, and now this gets us 
uh, to our work with Jinho are the following two things. Is there an integrable system behind the limiting distribution function? Some beautiful Tracy Widom type expression maybe? And thirdly, well, for numerical purposes in particular, can we do better? Is there a simple Ferrari Schwann type determinantal formula? This was not known and here's the reason why. Because in in many problems in random matrix theory, when you have a limiting kernel, they always have this peculiar structure, at least if you're from integrable systems community, right? So this is this integrable, famous integrable structure, or Christoffel Dabu. Christoffel Dabu because these are all scaling limits of some orthogonal polynomial kernels, and the orthogonal polynomials have such a structure, the kernels, the Christoffel Dabu, Dabu kernel at least. But this is not true for these kernels that we face up there and this was uh, as a simple exercise proven in, in their paper Brian Wright and Sinclair. So you don't have this nice integrable structure. So the method that Craig and Harold developed in the early 90s it does not apply. Later on uh, and Percy Dave and Alexei they, they put uh, Craig's method in a Riemann Hilbert framework but also that heavily relies on this structure so that method is also out of the window. So, so what do you do? Okay, that, that's the, that was the, the roadblock that, that you face. Well, it is an easy roadblock in some sense because um, if something looks bad in one world, maybe you should go to Fourier world um, and it looks better, much better in, in this. Uh, so if you look at this kernel up here in Fourier world, it actually displays some integrable structure. That's more or less the, the essence of the method. Of course, in theoretical physics, this is, is a standard thing to do. Here, within topics of the framework of this conference, I would like to point out Mattia Cafasso and also our friend Marco Bertola, who's not here. Uh, they were, uh, at least to me, the first ones who used such tricks in the analysis, not, not of classical random matrix ensembles, but multi-time processes, okay? Good. So I will show you at the end, I mean I got like another 25 minutes, I will show you a little bit towards the end how it works. But for now results, so question was Genibre met Schrödinger. So and finally they meet. So this is the, the object that we analyze. So this is, we do a bit more general. The limiting distribution function in the real Genibre ensemble has gamma equal to one, okay? Um, I can show you, um, so this is this formula up here. Uh, uh, so this one, if you take the square root, you get what I just had on the previous slide, but you can artificially introduce a gamma here. I will say something about the meaning of this gamma in a few minutes. Okay, now to present the results, well, we, we use Riemann Hilbert techniques, but they are not so, I would say, fundamentally different from, from, from say, Craig's formulas, because also there are the Poinlevé functions you could, in principle, formulate in terms of solution to Riemann Hilbert problem. Okay, so this problem uh, is uh, standard to people working in nonlinear wave theory. Okay, um, and there are quite a few in the audience who do that. Uh, Zagorov Shabbat Riemann Hilbert problem. I, I will explain a little bit the terminology here. For now, it's just a problem in complex analysis. You need to find matrix function, bold X, uh, involving spectral variable Z, and then, well, gamma, this is precisely the gamma up there, and then a variable that I call X. So X is a rescaled version of our T up there. Okay, so X and gamma are in particular real. Now, uh, uh, properties uh, that a bold X should satisfy standard, well, some jump, right? So analyticity with, in, the, in the complex plane with some cut here, just the real axis and continuous extension on the closed planes. Good. Um, uh, then the measure of how far the limiting values are apart from each other, AKA jump condition. This is this guy here. Um, so this is right identity plus rank one matrix and here coefficient R appears. So R for us is, is this one. 
e to the minus a quarter z squared, and the uh, gamma appears out front with a, uh, with, a, with a square root. I like to point out, and then people in nonlinear wave theory understand why I do this, if you take here an absolute value um, and gamma is equal one, and then unfortunately this, what's called the reflection coefficient, is precisely equal to one at z equals zero. And that causes trouble, okay? If gamma, however, is strictly less than one, of course, you never face this, okay? Good. Uh, now, um, if you play around with these two properties, you will realize that they do not uniquely determine bold x. You need uh, to gauge the value at some point, and this is usually done at infinity, so you require that the limit of bold x at infinity is just the identity two by two matrix. Good. So here's a problem. Now the first thing, of course, to ask yourself is does it have a solution? Um, this is for people in the field a standard exercise. Uh, um, this, is, this problem is uniquely solvable for any of those parameters, x and gamma, and we also need some more information. So the information is that um, this extends to a full asymptotic series, and the first coefficient here, if you look at the 1, 2 entry, well, it is real and it is continuous in the x variable for any gamma uh, in there. Why is this important? Well, because this coefficient that goes in into the Tracy rhythm type formula, so this is the result. The ft gamma, you could take the square root, is this piece times combination of cosh and singe. So let's do a, a check. So if gamma is equal to one, that's the one for the distribution function. Then you have gamma equals one, so this is gone. You have cosh minus singe. This gives one exponential. And this reproduces exactly Tracy Witham formula for GOE, except that you do not have q squared, which is hastings McCloud, but you got this, well, y in modulus squared here. That's the only difference, okay? I will get to that, I will get to that, yes. Yes, very similar, okay. Um, maybe I will quickly uh, uh, explain the, the rest of the slide and then I will, I will make the comment about Momar. Um, so here the, the mu, very much like in GOE, if you know Momar Dieng's uh, work, is, well, the antiderivative of this function y. Again, in GOE, this would just be the antiderivative of hastings McLeod, or in that case, with gamma ablowitz segur solution, okay? Um, um, one, two coefficient is used to construct that y thing. That's why we need here some properties, right? This, this should be integrable, and also the asymptotics works out. So those integrals are well defined. Um, just to say. Um, this identity, precisely this identity, is not quite what Momar had in, 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 in 2005. This is a so-called Tracy Widom identity in a superimposed Gaussian orthogonal ensemble that was studied by Peter Forrester in 2006. The, the formula Momar had um, has this piece out front and then combination of cosh and singe, but also a gamma replaced by gamma bar, right? Which is this flip, gamma to two minus gamma in some sense. So it's not quite Momar's formula, but extremely similar, okay? Good, so that's the formula. Um, now, where's Professor Schrödinger? So, well, people again in nonlinear wave theory know very well where he's hiding. Uh, if not, I will quickly tell you. So, this function bold x, that was the one that solves the problem. This exists, we prove it. So, you define new object psi, standard, absolutely standard. This satisfies Riemann Hilbert problem, aka it has a jump on the real <coughs> axis. Then, this will have a jump. But if you look at the right combination, namely logarithmic x derivative, this is actually entire function. This is achieved by this conjugation here. It's entire function and you can compute it by, by uh, Liouville theorem using behavior at infinity. What comes out is, well, a formula for this, aka a differential equation for psi. And that is the reason why it's called zakharov shabat riemann hilbert problem, because this is an extremely famous two by two ODE system. It was first written down at the sort of at the dawn of inverse scattering theory in 1972 by Zakharov and uh, Shabat. Okay, it is intimately related to scattering theory of nonlinear Schrödinger type equations. To be more precise, so if you know inverse scattering theory, you know what I'm talking about. If not, so here is an example. 
take a nonlinear wave equation in one plus one dimension. So this is here out front is just ordinary uh, Schrodinger, but now you have this nonlinear term here, right? This is the defocusing NLS. You, if you want to solve the initial value problem, Cauchy problem, with initial data on a Schwartz space, how do you do this? Well, inverse scattering has a recipe for you in place, how to do it. Namely, first, you take this initial data and you go back to the Sakharov Shabbat system and you plug it in there, wherever you see the Y. Okay? So now you have a 2x2 two two ODE system and you have to compute its scattering data, in particular the reflection coefficient. This is a classical topic uh, in ODE theory. Now, it turns out there's not much room to breathe here, namely the mapping from initial data to the reflection coefficient is a bijection between these two spaces. And that's why I said earlier, unfortunately for us, the reflection coefficient that we have, it does not satisfy this condition here. We have equality at one point, okay? That's an issue, okay? Nevertheless, this would be called the direct scattering transform. Now once, at least abstractly, you have the reflection coefficient in your hand, you go to the Riemann-Hilbert problem, substitute it in there, and then turn on time, right? You want to solve PDE. So far, you don't have any time. Well, you introduce time by sort of uh, uh, um, the, the perturbation in the exponent here about z, you perturb by z squared. Now you have Riemann-Hilbert problem, provided the solution exists, it's going to be unique and in turn you have solved the PDE up here plus the initial condition next to it. Okay, this is the recipe of inverse scattering transform. So to summarize what, what is going on for us in Genebra, well, we got limiting distribution function in the real Genebra ensemble. We have connected it to a, um, a solution of a distinct inverse scattering problem, right? Because our problem involves solution to Riemann-Hilbert problem, which is exactly the inverse scattering problem, and we have the reflection coefficient. So that's how the two worlds meet. You got this nonlinear wave thing here. There's, I think, another workshop in a couple of weeks about this. And you got random matrix theory on the other side. So in some sense, they have come together. And this is, at least in my knowledge, still pretty rare that you have random matrix theory to uh, nonlinear wave theory connection. But here it happens. It's not Poilevi, it's not Gumbel, it's well this scattering uh, 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 background. Okay? Um, ah. Before I go to this, of course, uh, there's nothing special here about this NLS. If you do a higher order perturbations, uh, Z cube, then you land on KDV and, and even higher ones on a full hierarchy of nonlinear evolution equations. Okay? Good. Why do you care about all of this? Well, the thing is, one thing that now you can systematically compute our tail, tail expansions, tail estimates. There's two of them, of course, right and left. As usual in random matrix theory, one of them is super easy. You don't need all of these formulas, but the other one is always hard. And as it is in Gaussian orthogonal ensembles or GOE, GS, either left one is the hard one. And now this Riemann-Hilbert inverse scattering connection gives you an efficient way to compute these tail expansions. Um, so we did this for all gamma between zero and one, the, it's gonna just go down exponentially fast and the rate of decay hinges to a, a value of the poly, this is the poly logarithm uh, index three over two. I like to point out that a few months before we did this with Jinho, uh, the uh, probability community in Warwick also computed the left tail, but only for gamma equals one. However, they used a completely different method. This was purely probabilistic. They used connection to coalescence processes. This is purely analytic, okay? Good. There are some outstanding tasks to be done. The, the big one, if you attended uh, Oleg's lecture on Monday about connection problems and connection coefficients, is as usual the numerical constant, which sits here. At the moment, this is an open problem. We can do some numerical uh, evaluations uh, of that in particular, but the numerics only at gamma equals one. Okay. Good. Um, here are graphs. Um, these are the matchings between the asymptotic expansions in blue dashed. 
This is uh, the right one. So here, a T, well, the asymptotic should only kick in for sufficiently large T, but it's already pretty good at T equals one, say. And this is the left tail. Uh, so you go to uh, minus infinity in a semi-logarithmic plot. And of course, it's a straight line because it goes down just exponentially. It's very different from tracy Witham behavior where you got some cubic stuff going on. Good. The next result that we found was the analog of Ferrari Spohn formula for this distribution function. It is that simple. So the distribution function of the largest real eigenvalue in the real Genebra ensemble is just this Fraton determinant with this super simple kernel. Okay? This one here. And that's the one I use to generate the plots and compute the moments. Okay, good. Now, before I show you some of the techniques, so outstanding tasks to be done. I mentioned already one. This is the uh, connection coefficient um, uh, challenge. Uh, another one, I said we artificially introduced gamma in here. Okay, so one might ask now, what is the probabilistic interpretation actually of this one when gamma is different from one, right? It's only natural. Well, there's um, some hope that this hinges to uh, thinning processes. Uh, this I've done myself in, 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 in GOE. Um, and the, the, the upshot is always when you thin a determinantal point process, the thinned version is still determinantal. Well, here you work with Pfaffian point processes, but also there the same result applies. So there is natural expectation that this hinges to distribution function in a thinned uh, Ginebra uh, uh, orthogonal ensemble. Um, Third one um, that you can ask, of course, is the generalization of this one up here, uh, which is not even known to the best of my knowledge for GOE. So what generalizes ferrari spohn formula when you have the generating function parameter gamma in there? It's unfortunately not just a square root of gamma in front of the S. That would be the natural guess, but it's wrong. <laughs> so now this is open. OK, now, uh, a few minutes about uh, techniques. And again, uh, I would like to emphasize Mattia and Marco um, used, used it in, in, in the theory of multi-time processes before. Um, so this is the kernel that you face. Right? And I said earlier the roadblock that you have in front of you is that this does not have this integrable structure, not the difference of arguments in the denominator. OK, so what do you do? Well, um, there is uh, the um, statement that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian, right? So here's a Gaussian and Fourier transform is a Gaussian. Um, here, however, we, it's not going to be enough to just take Fourier integral over the real axis. And you will see right away in the next slide why that is so. So you have to have uh, um, um, integration in the complex plane. But that's okay, as long as you come in here from infinity and you go out in the right sector, you can do all kinds of things in the middle and it's still uh, true, okay? Now you take this identity and you got two of them up here, right? One with x plus s and one with y plus s. So what you do is in one of those formulas, you take this one with a plus sign and the other one with a minus sign. So what you will get is you will get three integrals, right? Those are those, and then you're tempted to permute the order, of course. And now you have to be careful, and that's the reason why you can't take integrals over the real axis. Because if you permute the orders like I did here, you have to make sure that this inner bracket is, well, uh, finite. Um, so, and if lambda and w were on the real axis, it would not be that case. Okay? But now they're on the complex plane, and as long as I ensure that one contour lies on top of the other, like here, uh, this will be all nicely convergent. I can compute it, and I get to this level here. Okay? And this level is already very promising, because remember, integrable structure for these kernels hinges always to the difference of arguments, which you already see here. Um, but it's not enough because um, this is, well, not really the kernel that you should look at because the determinant, you always have these operators acting on some L2 space and this is a chopped L2 space, say, from T to infinity. So the kernel should really be this times a characteristic function. So what you have to do is you have to massage the characteristic function in, in such an integral form. Okay, so here's exercise. Could this be true? So it is W is variable in the upper half plane and Y and T are real distinct. 
So is this true? Well, first off, this integral is not absolutely convergent, okay, but it's conditionally convergent, say integrate by parts. Now, why is, is this a characteristic function times that? Well, suppose that, let's see, y is bigger than t. If y is bigger than t, you can deform the real axis to close contour in the upper half plane. And this is good because if y is bigger than t and mu is in the upper half plane, this will be exponentially fast decaying up there. Okay, however, when you do that, at some point you have to move, well, the contour through mu is equal to w, which is in the upper half plane, so you pick up a residue, yes? That's why if you divide out one over two pi i, that thing is exactly the residue, okay? Times one. If y is less than t, however, you do the same trick in the lower half plane, you're not gonna pick up a residue, it's gonna be zero. And that's what is uh, achieved by characteristic function. Okay, good, and now you're essentially done. Um, well, at least for this slide. So you have to multiply this onto that. Um, you get, again, three integrals, and everything is nicely convergent. You can permute the order, and now you realize this. So product of kernel times characteristic function is this. Two integrals out front over the plane, and then one integral over a contour in the, in the upper half plane, right? So it's indicated up there. This one inside the bracket does not involve the variables x and y at all, right? X is here y is there and there's no x and y in there. This depends only after integration on lambda and mu. And what you notice now is of course, this is the kernel of the classical Fourier transform on the real axis and this is the kernel of the inverse Fourier transform on the axis. So in other words, this is just, if you view it as operators, operator composition of Fourier transform f times integral operator with this kernel times inverse Fourier transform. Okay, three minutes, excellent. Um, why is this good? Because if you use partial fractions, this has Christoffel Dabou, aka integrable structure, okay? So that's how you set up the problem. You're far from being done now because you have just manipulated one kernel. Ah, by the way, why is this good? Well, because I work with Fratom determinants and they are invariant under unitary conjugation, right? But that's not all there is. It's not just the Fratom determinant. There's those finite rank pieces. You have to massage them also appropriately, but more or less all of it goes through. But I have no time to discuss more techniques. They're all in the paper um, with Jinho. Okay, as a final message, so there is now a connection, this is Jean Genibre, um, emeritus at Paris 11, there is a connection between random matrix theory, more precisely the real Genibre ensemble and his world, Erwin Schrödinger, and you can build the bridge by using some, well, Fourier techniques. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, I think you've been very generous with references. However, I would like to add two. Uh, one is Hans-Jürgen Sommers, uh, who also found the Pfaffian structure of the region Ebon ensemble in the summer 2007. And just a tiny uh, moment later, Tao Nagao and Peter Forrester also had a paper. Now this brings me to my question. Uh, Peter and Tao, they also looked at the elliptic Genebra ensemble. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to interpolate between uh, real Genebra and uh, GUE. In particular, if you take a limit called weak non-hermeticity. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's a chance uh, to enhance your integrable uh, framework to accommodate one parameter deformation? I mean, the, the deformation of the Gary kernel is known, yeah. so yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. do you think this is possible? Uh, yeah, so the first thing, thank you about the references with, with, with Sommers, there's just so many people, I, I'm sorry. Um, um, yes, yeah, so it's about elliptic, right, so interpolation between this uh, nonlinear Schrodinger world and Poinlevé world. I've looked at the kernels, um, there is some substantial math that you first have to develop, because this falls into the framework of these, well, integral kernels for which you have Riemann-Hilbert, but not matrix, but rather operator valued. So I would expect there's some integral differential equation going between the two worlds. 
But these techniques, how to get them out, those equations from Riemann-Hilbert world, this has first has to be developed. The only instance that I know that people have done this is in KPZ. Uh, they have used Craig's method, uh, well, uh, Ivan and, and, and Amir and, and Jeremy Castell to derive some integral differential equation. I expect the same goes in between those two worlds. But I, I don't have any formulas or results to show about that. Are there any further questions? Say again? Data you get for NLS with that no, no, we don't know. I mean, this is exactly when the bijection fails, right? So, mm -hmm. it is, a, yeah, of course, good question. Um, Just out uh, of curiosity. Yeah, yeah, so here this, so this is for us, this is violated. We, we don't know. I've asked many people in nonlinear wave theory the exact same question, mm -hmm. and they usually tell me this is not the way to look at it. Right? You start with a nice initial data and you get a reflection coefficient, but not the other way around. In particular, when this is violated. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Sorry. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Thomas again. Thank you.